Should Western nations have set up a no-fly zone over Aleppo? Or do such military interventions tend to make things worse? I'll ask the French intellectual and one of the architects of NATO's war in Libya, Bernard-Henri Lévy. I'm Mehdi Hassan. Also on the show, Indian administered Kashmir has once again been the scene of violent unrest. So, is an independent Kashmir now the only solution to the long running conflict in that region? That's our debate. But first, some say a Donald Trump presidency will usher in a new era of US isolationism and an end to invasions, no fly zones, and the rest. But as the fighting in Syria rages on, is there still a case for so called humanitarian interventions? This week's headliner the French philosopher, author, and proud liberal hawk Bernard Henri Levy. Bernard Henri Levy, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Given the election of Donald Trump, who's perceived by many to be an isolationist, is the age of Western military intervention, of liberal intervention, which you've so strongly supported, of humanitarian intervention, as many call it, is that now over? I don't know if it is over, but it, is, it will be probably frozen for a few years. Yes, uh, Mr. Trump said it very clearly. He does not give a damn about uh, human rights. He does not give a damn about uh, democracy. And he's one of those who believe that democracy is good for the, the white, uh, protestant, uh, European or American, and bad for the third world, or for the developing country, or for South America, or for Arab world. So two uh, uh, standards for him. You have written and spoken a great deal about the horrific situation in East Aleppo, where residents have been under siege, been barrel bombed for a long time now. President elect Trump seems much less keen on working with the Syrian opposition, with the rebels. He's much keener on forging some sort of alliance with uh, the Assad regime, with the Russians. What happens to the people of East Aleppo now, in your view? For me, the situation in Aleppo will be the, the shame of our generation. I am ashamed to be the contemporary of what happens in Aleppo. I will uh, ask forgiveness all the rest of my life to the coming generation to have been witness of what is happening in Aleppo and not having been able to prevent that. Uh, this, for me, is the absolute um, embodiment of the evil today. Civilians under fire, war of a dictatorship on one side and of ISIS on the other side against the civilians. This is the absolute shame of our times. And you would have liked to have seen a US-led military intervention, a no-fly zone maybe, which a President Clinton probably would have done, but a President Trump certainly won't. I would, of course. Uh, uh, I am among those who hope for no-fly zone, buffer zone, and uh, um, twisting the arm and preventing Bashar al-Assad and ISIS, these two twins, from continuing okay. this massacre, this bloodbath. Isn't the problem for you that Trump has clearly told a series of fabrications about his own positions, about the positions of his opponents, but for many would also say that one thing he's right about, one thing he's accurate about that's resonated with U.S. voters is that the wars of choice that the U.S. and its allies have fought over the past decade and a half, many of them supported by yourself, they have been a colossal waste of blood and treasure. They weren't worth it, they weren't successful, and the cost for the average American was far too high. Wait a minute. The colossal spread of blood today is in Syria. The, the absolute nightmare is in Syria. The, there's, the a, there's, a, there's a fair few nightmares is... in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, places where the West did intervene and where it didn't no. turn out well. In, a, in, a, in, in, in Iraq, the, the nightmare came from the, the war between Iraq and Iran. This is what the worst bloodbath of, the, of this period. In Afghanistan, it was a bloodbath created by the Taliban's. Uh, and in Syria, it's the bloodbath created by ISIS and Bashar al-Assad. If you compare to these three situations, Taliban massacre, Iran-Iraq uh, war, and today Hold Bashar on, government. If you, com wait, okay. if okay. you compare Libya, if you compare the war, <laughs> if you compare the situation in Libya, it is infinitely less 
concerning that the three I just quoted. The result of the intervention is much, even if it is not perfect, is much infinitely better than the result of non-intervention. I'll, I'll come back to Libya in a moment, but just sticking to the wider intervention point, you can't deny that there is a war fatigue and intervention fatigue in the US across parts of the West on both left and right, and Trump took advantage of yeah. that fact by pretending to be anti-war. You can't deny True. that there's a connection between failed wars abroad, especially on Hillary Clinton's watch, and Trump's success at home. Right, there is a great fatigue about democratic values in general. One of the effects of this fatigue is probably the cutoff of any help given to the Syrian rebels, any effort to stop the bloodbath in, in Yemen, and so on. Don't you bear responsibility for that fatigue because those wars, many of which you advocated for, from the perspective of the American voter, did turn out to be failures. Afghanistan was not supposed to look this way 15 years after the Americans went in. Iraq was not to look this way 13 years after the Americans went in. Uh, Libya, yes, you may say it's better off than it was under Gaddafi, but it's clearly still a mess, divided between different governments, ISIL on the rise, bloodshed, chaos, militias. It is, it is still a mess, it is still a chaos, but nothing comparable with Syria. As for Iraq, I have never been favorable to the war in Iraq. I always thought it was a mistake because there was not on the ground an appeal for that and there was not in the civil society of Iraq a demand, uh, a, a real concrete and supported and documented uh, a demand for democracy. So the situations are not comparable. But the fatigue is, is true all over the Western world, not, not only in America. You, we have that in France also. Just sticking with Libya, on Libya, given the chaos and bloodshed there, how much responsibility do you feel, having pushed hard for that intervention, having pushed President Sarkozy, Secretary of State Clinton back in 2011, to intervene on the side of the rebels? When you look at the rise of ISIL, for example, when you look at the human rights abuses, how regretful do you feel? How bad do you feel? I don't regret anything. None of the innocent lives lost? You don't feel guilty about any of the innocent lives that have been lost in the last five years in Libya? Of course not. What, what I feel what I regret with the, from the bottom of my heart is that the West and the Arab League, after having appealed, called for an intervention, thought that the job was finished was Gaddafi was toppled. It was not finished. There was a, a duty of uh, democracy building, of state building, with what just starting after the toppling of Gaddafi. The gross responsibility uh, of the world was there. My regret is that. So what do you say to the Libyan who says, look, in my country before 2011, I had a horrible leader in Colonel Gaddafi, but I didn't have ISIL. Now I have ISIL in my country. That's thanks to an intervention that I didn't, you know, that came in from outside. No, no, they don't have... No. Wait a minute. If I were a, a, Li a Libyan citizen, I would know, I would be proud of belonging to a country which does fight and successfully ISIS. ISIS but, was but why is ISIL there? there? It's because of an intervention that created chaos in Libya that you supported. The chaos came from that intervention. We may, we may discuss about the cause of the rise of ISIS. Maybe it has something to do with the 2003 war in Iraq of America. But Libya is another story. Today in Libya, the Libyan people, the Libyan fighters of Misrata do fight successfully ISIS. They kick ISIS themselves out of the city of Sirte. Look at what is happening at Sirte. It is not Western intervention. It is the Libyan themselves who say no ISIS on our territory. ISIS out of Sirte. And they achieve the goal, and, uh, and they do it. And that is admirable, but they're in CERT, partly because of that intervention. Let me read to you a conclusion from a recent report by the British Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee, which said that the result of the Libya intervention was, quote, political and economic collapse, humanitarian and migrant crises, widespread human rights violations, the spread of Gaddafi's weapons, and the growth of ISIL in North Africa. They are, they are wrong. The disaster was, was Gaddafi. The disaster was a face-à-face -face, uh, of dictatorship and uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood and uh, uh, possible jihadism and so on. This was a disaster. The rise of democracy in the Arabic world, the birth of democracy, 
is as such a good news. I okay. continue to think that, and if I play the role in that, I am proud of it. Your critics might say, Bernard Henri Livy, isn't it easy for you to be this philosopher, this public intellectual, this armchair warrior, they say, pushing so regularly for other people's children to go to war? Why don't you sign up? Have you ever considered signing up to go and fight in these wars or asking your kids to? It's very easy to call for military action when it's not your children who are I dying fight, in Iraq I, or I Syria. I do. I do. I do, I do consider, and I fight with my means. My means is not to hold a, a weapon, my means is a camera. Then you are right. Okay. When you appeal for something, you have to commit yourself. This is what I did all my life. One final question, Bernard-Henri Levy. Just looking at the bigger picture, is the Trump victory in the US part of a rather disconcerting uh, shift towards illiberal democracy, towards a new far-right politics, a new authoritarianism that becomes maybe the norm in the West post-Brexit, post-Trump, post maybe a Marine Le Pen win in the French presidential election? I, I hope with all my heart that Marine Le Pen, your prediction, I don't even want to express it, will not, will not happen. But you are right, there is this tendency to illiberal uh, regimes, to uh, democrature, as we say in France. It, it ranges from uh, Hungary and Poland to America, and uh, hopefully not, but maybe one day, who's, who knows, uh, at least part of France. This is true. There is a, a, a fatigue of democracy. There is a hatred of, uh, of human rights. There is a despise to, to liberal values who are a, a, a heavy tendency of the whole modernity and which is coming back very strongly today. And this is something against which any liberal in the West, in the Arab world and all over the world has to fight. Bernard-Henri Levy, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. It's coming up to 50 years of occupation for Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Thankfully, their humble and valiant elected leaders in the Palestinian Authority are representing them, fighting the good fight on their behalf with the respect and the adoration of the Palestinian people. Right? No, sadly, the Palestinian Authority, the PA, established as an interim government in 1994 as part of the Oslo process for the sole, single, solitary, for Pete's sake, nothing else but this purpose, to see over Palestinian affairs in the occupied territories. Well, the PA doesn't seem to be representing its people very well. A recent poll found that a clear majority of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, six in ten of them, what President Mahmoud Abbas, whose term in office expired almost eight years ago, to resign. Eight out of every ten Palestinians thinks the PA is corrupt, and more Palestinians think the PA is a burden than believe it's an asset. Ouch. A lot of this discontent probably has to do with the fact that under the Oslo Accords, the very same Palestinian government that is supposed to be looking after its people under occupation is in fact also obligated to coordinate security with the Israeli occupiers. And it goes way beyond coordination. According to human rights groups, the PA, not just the Israeli army, the Palestinian Authority has engaged in horrific human rights abuses against its own people, from arbitrary arrests and detentions to unfair trials to torture and the excessive use of force. Palestinian critics of the PA also say their leaders aren't willing to stand up to Israel. They're more interested in photo ops on the international stage. Take the boycott, divestment and sanctions or BDS movement, which the PA won't endorse despite it having the support of a whopping 85% of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. No, we do not support the boycott of Israel, says President Abbas. We don't ask anyone to boycott Israel itself. Look, I get it. The PA is dealing with a nuclear-armed occupying power which has the backing of the world's only superpower. It has a very tough job. But the lack of support that the PA has from its own people is glaring and many would say pretty embarrassing. Maybe, just maybe, instead of trying to only make peace with the Israelis, the leaders of the PA should try making peace with their own people too. Indian-administered Kashmir, one of the most militarized places on earth, has been the scene of violent unrest over the past five months since security forces killed a young separatist fighter, Burhan Wani. More than 90 people have died and thousands have been injured, some deliberately blinded by Indian security forces, according to human rights groups. So, are those Kashmiris who favor independence from India any closer to realizing that goal? And who's to blame for all the bloodshed? 
Joining me now are two guests, both originally from Indian administered Kashmir and both Muslims, but Athar Zia, professor of anthropology at the University of Northern Colorado and founder of online journal Kashmir Lit, is in favor of Kashmiri independence from India, while Suwale Keen, writer, critic and founder of Kashmir Oral History, is in favor of being part of India. Thank you both for joining me on Upfront in the arena. Um, Athar Zia, briefly make for our global audience the case for Kashmiri independence in your view. Uh, thank you very much, Mehdi, for having me. Uh, I think Kashmir is an idea whose time has come. And uh, I think Kashmiri people have given a referendum in blood. And uh, these past three months have proved that. And uh, when we have to make a case for Kashmiri independence, I don't think it's a point of making a case, because the case is already made. UN has made Kashmiri people a party to the dispute, and not just India and Pakistan, because the case of Kashmir, it was a country before 1947, even before India and Pakistan were the countries that they are now. And just to be clear, you want uh, Kashmir, i.e. Indian administered Kashmir, Pakistan administered K Kashmir, Kashmir on both sides of the unofficial border, the line of control. You want it to be independent, not part of Pakistan, not part of India. Yes, exactly true. So Ali Keen, uh, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with self-determination in the 21st century? Uh, it's not about self-determination as it's about uh, the unfinished, unfinished business of partition. It's about the determination of Pakistan to wrest uh, control from India of this part of JNK. Now when we characterize this dispute as a Kashmir issue, we are doing uh, in injustice to the whole lot of people who are not Kashmiri, whom we club together as Kashmiris. For example, the Indian administer, so-called administered Kashmir, is basically three divisions. The In the south, there is the Jammu division, and in the north, the largest uh, region, that is the Ladakh, and uh, then there is the Kashmir Valley, which is wedged between these two regions. Now, it's uh, the demand for secession is only confined to the a certain section of people within the valley. The majority of the population in that part of the world say they want to be independent, according to the polls. Yeah, it is the majority of the population, but within that majority there are nuance, there are certain uh, communities, there are Shia communities which are not involved in this sessionism. There are Gujars, Bakarwals who are Muslims, but they are not party to it. And there are the Sikhs and the uh, Hindu uh, Pandit minority. So it is not a homogeneous uh, region. Uh, uh, Atharzia, of course, the polls do show that uh, Kashmir is living in the valley in Indian administered Kashmir, what India calls Jammu and Kashmir, JNK. Uh, the polls show that they do overwhelmingly support either secession, independence, joining with Pakistan. But only 1% of Kashmiri Hindus back independence. And one in three residents of that part of the world is either Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist or Christian. Should their views be ignored? Of course not. Uh, I do not think that uh, or most of the Kashmiris, and uh, I'm taking into consideration all religious denominations, I do not think anyone can be ignored. They're all party to this dispute. But then we also have to look at what the majority decision is, which is heavily for independence. And when you talk about Kashmir Valley, we're talking about three provinces, and I agree with Saleh there that we are three provinces. So Ali Keen, almost 100 people dead this year, thousands injured, scores detained without charge. Is your view on the recent violence uh, that of the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who says the fundamental reason for disturbances in Kashmir is cross-border terrorism promoted by our neighboring country, i.e. Pakistan. Is it really that simple? Surely not. There are many ways of looking at the Kashmir problem. If we look at the victims, the ones who uh, while fighting or attacking the police got injured or killed, if we look at them, they come from very poor socio-economic background. So it is also not just religion, uh, religious extremism, there is also an aspect of economic deprivation. And if we look at the border skirmishes that are happening even today, 
then it's also a border dispute and we cannot rule out the Pakistan factor. So I'm saying that it is not just one thing. You're saying it's lots of things, but I want to ask you a specific question about a specific thing. A recent investigation in the Guardian newspaper called the recent violence in Indian administered Kashmir, quote, the first instance of a modern democracy systematically and willfully shooting at people to blind them. It said nearly 6,000 civilians had been injured. 972 of them suffered injuries to their eyes. There's no justification for that, is there? I don't see any country in the world where you can, you have a right to write or maybe uh, smash the head of a policeman with a stone and uh, they are not expected to retaliate or defend themselves. Looking at the pellet thing, pellets came to the picture when people were, uh, demanded a non-lethal uh, mode of mob control because we all so are, are you okay with the Indian security forces blinding protesters? I'm not okay with anybody dying or getting injured, even if they are breaking the rules, because finally those are our own people and we have to find methods in which we can also we can contain their violence without causing any you know damage to life and limb. Oh, no, hold on, on Suwale, let Afizia respond Pellet to what injuries. you just said. I want you to respond to the point that uh, Suwale raises, which at the end of the day, a lot of these people are quote-unquote militants, separatists, fighters, they're breaking the law. What's your response to that? Not all of them are non-violent protesters. The fighter himself, Burhan Wani, no. who, who, whose death mm -hmm. uh, kicked off all of this, was a quote-unquote jihadist. And uh, when you say jihadist, to a lot of Kashmiris, he was a freedom fighter. No doubt he was from Hezbollah Mujahideen. We have to tackle that reality as well. But what I think is there is a curb, not just a curb, but there is a repressive regime in place in the Indian-controlled Kashmir, in the Indian-held Kashmir. There is, no dis there is no space for dissent. So where do these boys go? Are you saying that the Indian government, by, by preventing political dissent, has encouraged violent res resistance? Kashmiris have been the most peaceful in demanding a UN-mandated self-determination plus independence, which they want. A lot of people at home will be watching and saying, well, look, we do hear a lot about the violence that Indian security forces perpetrate against, uh, quote, against Muslim protesters in the valley. We don't hear so much about the violence perpetrated against Hindu families uh, in Indian-administered Kashmir mm -hmm. by uh, fighters, by armed groups. Thousands of Hindu families driven from their homes by some of these groups mm -hmm. who you say are labelled freedom fighters what about the injustice done to them the injustice done to them to the pundits you mean the yes. Kashmiri pundits well I think it's the most painful and traumatic period in Kashmir's freedom movement I think everyone needs to acknowledge that and I think people who have been implicated on those crimes have also come back and they've acknowledged those and they've apologized to those people I think mo a lot of uh, reconciliation has taken place so Ale is shaking his head why are you shaking your head so Ale? you disagree there has been no reconciliation and all. In fact, uh, ever since uh, militancy erupted in 1989 in Kashmir, the whole fabric of the society has been torn apart. It's not just uh, Hindus who fled. At that time, droves of Muslims and other minorities also fled to escape from them. What we are experiencing is a civil war. And I dispute this that the majority of Kashmiris, the ethnic, real, bona fide Kashmiris are uh, in favor of this thing because if you see what are the parameters we judge by there is also 65 percent voting means like people who believe in the Indian democratic system now we have to understand the people who vote are not the same people who pelt stones Atar Zia we're running out of time briefly respond to what Suwale is saying about the voting what, what I think India is imposing is not a democracy. It's a politics of democracy, where elections is made into a motive of everything is normalized. Go and ask the people how elections are used. And if you look at occupation law, I think elections are, are to be held. There is nothing for governance. What else do you do with these people who need water, who need power, who need roads? That's why they go for. This is a politics of democracy happening in Kashmir. It's not a democracy. It's, a, it's, an, it's an internment camp. It's a siege. Do you believe there will be independence for, that, for Kashmir in the next 10, 20, 30 years? I don't know how long the struggle is going to be, but Kashmiris are used to a long resilience. So we do not know what we are dealing with here, how long it is going to be. But you do see a strong anti-India sentiment. Okay, well, let me put that as a last question to Suwale Keen. How long can India hold on? to a state of, what it calls a state of its own, Jammu and Kashmir, which, where the majority of people don't seem to want to be part of that state, and where the violence, there are mass uh, detentions, curfews, killings, rapes, you can't just undo that. That legacy is there, Suwale. 
in my opinion human rights violation cannot be a justification for seeking uh, freedom because the freedom fighters uh, murdered as many as 13000 kashmiri muslims now no no human rights uh, activists is talking about that so uh, solution part one would be to convert the loc into the international border so that people can say okay this is a fate i comply this is a done deed okay what next another thing is that we have to address the religious radicalization that's uh, prevalent in the valley and third thing is that we have to also look at the socio economic factors that are leading children from poor family towards violence maybe the last word to very briefly us. we've only got a few seconds well i do want uh, to kind of like say that uh, look at kashmir not as a bilateral dispute between india and pakistan it's not as simple as converting the loc the ceasefire line into an international border it's not that easy you have to look at history you have to look at what kashmir is about it's about self determination and this is un mandate okay. it's about independence we'll have to leave it there thank you both for joining me on upfront that's our show upfront will be back next week